So we're here with uh, Orion Teraban. He's a clinical psychologist with the channel Psych Hacks. Uh, Orion, could you just introduce yourself for us real quick? Sure. Um, as you said, I am a clinical psychologist. I've been in private practice for the last eight years. I specialize in men's mental health. All of my patients are men. I started the channel Psych Hacks about three years ago, and the idea was to take the teachings and the interventions that seemed to be working with this smaller cohort of men that I was seeing routinely and disseminating them on a wider level because I didn't think that the, let's say, 30 or so odd men that I worked with every year were necessarily significantly different than the vast majority of men out there. And it's been very successful. In fact, the response to the podcast has been more positive than I could have hoped when I started it. Last I saw it, it was, I think you picked up another 200,000 subscribers in just a couple months. Is that right? Yeah, it's sort of like how they say your first million is always the hardest to make. Maybe you notice this with your own growth. It's like getting to that first 100,000 was really tough. It took about two years, and then I got the next 100,000 in about two months, which mm -hmm. makes sense. I've noticed that with a lot of things, nothing happens for a long time until everything kind of happens at once. And so you, you've you uh, worked with, I think you said over a thousand men? Right? Oh, certainly, and, and women too. So mm -hmm. in my training, I worked with children, men, women. I did a little couple work, though I didn't do much of that throughout my training, and I don't do that in my private practice. I'm not taking on any new patients now because of the response to the channel. Now I'm simply doing individual consultations with men and women from all over the world. Okay, so those are on kind of like a, a one-off basis kind of thing? Some of them are one-off. Uh, sometimes I see folks for a, f a series of consultations, but it's not like therapy. The idea is not that we're gonna be meeting every week or every other week for an extended period of time. The idea is you have a very specific problem. I'm here to give you some actionable advice and you can go off and hopefully that will solve it and you'll never have to talk to me again. And I do that for both men and women because the channel is actually designed to be consumable for both men and women. I, my speciality is in men's mental health, but Psychax is for everybody. Is there a particular problem that stands out as being the most common problem or, or one that's particularly frequent? Well, because on Psychax, I talk about a number of different issues, money and business, spirituality, um, wisdom and life lessons. But the videos that consistently get the most views are about intersexual dynamics and relationships between men and women. Uh, so most of the consultation requests I get are on that issue. It's often men who are trying to get better at attracting the women that they want to be in relationships with, or they want to gut check, hey, here's my situation. Should I invest more? Should I pull out of the relationship? Or I'm already in this situation with a wife and kids. I'm very much leveraged and invested. How can I solve this problem that's coming up? With women, it's often, how do I get a husband? I think it's safe to say that you bring a lot of hard truths to men. A lot of things about female psychology that they don't realize, and maybe they should have realized a long time ago. And it would have been a lot more helpful if they did realize. So what, what I'm angling at is, so for example, um, when I was in high school, I took a lot of my dating advice from Hollywood movies. Sure, me too. So I thought, oh, I should be, you know, kind of like pathetic, but romantic and just, oh, you know, I don't really have a spine, but I just love you so much. And, and you'll love me too, now that I love you. Yeah, it turns out that showing up unannounced underneath a woman's window late at night actually isn't romantic. It's, it gets the police called on you. Yeah. Mm. So what, what would you say that women are attracted to, or what kind of man are women attracted to? Ooh, wow. So we know that attraction is both a very personal decision based on your experiences and your goals, but it's also informed by, let's say, certain biological realities. So attraction is a mix of things that are 
culturally influenced and biologically determined, mediated by personal experience and preference. So it's very difficult to say this man is what all women want. And that's why this space can be so contentious because anytime you get more particular about it, someone will say, well, that doesn't sound good to me or that's not what I'm looking for, as if that invalidates the entire, uh, let's say, archetype. Um, but in general, we know that individually, if you control for all other things, women will select this quality over this other quality. Like in general, if all other things are being equal, every other part of a man's personality, lifestyle, and presentation are exactly the same, and one guy's significantly wealthier than the other, they're gonna choose the wealthier guy because why not choose the wealthier guy? If two guys are completely identical in all other respects, but one guy is 6'2 and the other guy is 5'4, why not choose the 6'2 guy? So we do know that by examining things in that piecemeal way, that women typically want men who are a little bit older, who are stronger, who are taller, who make more money, who are a higher status, who are more successful, and are capable of inviting them into an emotionally compelling lifestyle. That's part of what women are attracted to. What they want also depends on their goals. Contrary to popular belief, some women just wanna fuck. Some women just wanna have sex. Um, and when they're looking for that, they prioritize a different subset of qualities than when they're looking to say, get married and settle down. So what a woman is looking for depends on what she wants. Mm -hmm. I noticed a lot of when you were giving the description of what they're attracted to or what women are attracted to, there's a lot of mores in there. Mm -hmm. a, a man who's more successful than them financially, a man who's taller than them, a man who's more capable. Uh, this might, I don't know if this is a good place to start since we're so early in the conversation, but what, what do you think about equitable marriages or, or, uh, marriages based on equity? Is that, is that the term they're using now? You mean like 50, 50 relationships yeah, yeah. where I want to marry my equal, that kind of a thing? Yes. Well, I think that they'll only work for a very small subset of people. And those people need to be very committed to those ideals and they need to be excellent communicators and negotiators, which most people are not. So what I've learned is that most women don't actually want 50-50 relationships. And it's actually pretty easy to, to understand why. In our culture, it, it's not unusual if a man were to pay for everything. You know, what, no one would think that that was strange. Um, so a 50-50 relationship probably is this enormous discount for a man to enter into a relationship because he could be expected to pay up to 100%. By the same token, in our culture, no one would look askance if a woman was paying 0% or investing 0% because, and she's investing zero if the guy's investing 100. And she probably won't go much past 50% investment. Like the idea that a woman is gonna be paying for 70, 30 of a relationship a woman's just gonna look at that arrangement and think, this isn't worth it for me. You know, this is a net loss to my necessarily limited resources. So 50 is like as far as she'll go in that relationship. And that's why the 50-50 thing doesn't work because even though it is fair, it doesn't feel fair. It's an enormous discount on what might be culturally expected of the man. And it's kind of like as, as much as a woman is willing to take on within the cultural expectations within that relationship. So what feels fair is not always what is fair and vice versa. Another, the other part of this is to try to find your equal. This is something that really tripped me up when I was younger. I was um, very much interested in finding a woman who could meet me intellectually, let's put it that way. And I was interested in quantum mechanics and esoteric spirituality and Shakespearean literature. And I just kept getting disappointed by the conversations that I was having with the women that I was dating. And I thought, oh, I, just, I just can't see myself in this relationship. And I potentially disqualified women that I could have had very satisfying relationships with on that ground. I remember I explained the situation to one of my mentors many, many years ago, and he just looked at me incredulously and said, Orion, why do you need to talk to a woman about quantum mechanics? It's like, do you need a woman for that? And it's like this light bulb went off on the top of my head. And, it's, and I thought, you know what? If I wanna talk about quantum mechanics, I can find someone else to talk about quantum mechanics. 
So I don't necessarily need that from my intimate romantic partner. So the idea that I need someone to meet me intellectually or who has the same depth of feeling as I do or who is interested in the kinds of things that I'm interested in, all of that is nonsense to me. And it gets in people's way more often than it helps them to find satisfying relationship partners. You had a really good uh, Kurt Vonnegut quote on that. Do you remember the one I'm referring to? I think so, because I have I love Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt, little side note, Kurt Vonnegut got me through one of my heartbreaks when I was in my 20s. One of the things that I've done in heart break moments is I'll pick an author that I like that seems to resonate with how I'm feeling in that moment and I'll just read his entire work. So I've done that for a few different authors in my life and Kurt Vonnegut is one of them. I love his like blend of cynicism and worldliness with his sincerity and idealism. He's a fascinating author. I wish I could have met him. He's great. And so I think I only quote Vonnegut in one of my episodes and it's from one of his lesser known collection of essays, I think it's called God Bless You, Dr. Kevorkian. And he talks about how the reason that marriage fails is functionally that you are not enough people. That back in the day, people lived in tribes and they married into extended kin networks. And so when a man married a woman, he didn't just get a woman, he got all of these male relatives that he could do things with. And when a woman married a man, she didn't just get a man, she got all these female relatives that she could talk to. Because that's really what men want. They want, other, they want people to do things with, and women want people to talk to. And nowadays, we don't have that extended tribal system or that kinship network, and so you just get one other person. A man gets one other person to do something with, but it's a woman. And a woman gets one other person to talk to, but it's a man. And so there's this kind of fundamental mismatch where we kind of expect, the men sometimes expect the woman to be like their buddy. Uh -huh. And women sometimes expect their husband or their boyfriend to be their girlfriend. And that's not what we're here to do. And in point of fact, throughout most of human history, men and women have not really spent a lot of time together. Men during the day were often with other men. Maybe they were off hunting, sometimes for days or weeks at a time. Women were generally with other women and the children, tending to the home front, cooking, doing handicrafts, and and just socializing, basically. And that's changed significantly with the collapse down into the nuclear family. And not only are you, my partner, supposed to be an entire village, you're supposed to fulfill every role of that village. You're supposed to be my, my therapist and my teacher and my cheerleader and my sexy mistress playmate and my drinking buddy and my golf partner and my business, my co-business owner. And it's like, that's too many things. And when people, I made a video about this a long time ago, every time you say the word and, it, the likelihood that you get what you want decreases significantly. So and is expensive. I mean, just think about it like this. If you're only attracted to one out of 10 people, and you think that one out of 20 people are intelligent, if you want someone who's attractive and intelligent, that means one out of 200 people. And what's the likelihood that, that person is single, available, and also interested in you? So if you just say and a few times, even if you are in a major metropolitan center like New York, there might only be on the average of like 10,000 to 20,000 people who meet all of those criteria. And a lot of them will be spoken for and a lot of them won't be interested in you. So you say and five times and you're functionally looking for a needle in a haystack in the middle of a city full of people that you could have otherwise satisfying relationships with. But that's the nature of things is that no one really wants to settle even though all relationships require some degree of settling, right? And we don't want to settle because we now with our technology live in a world dominated by the illusion of infinite optionality. I lived in New York for about 11 years in the early 2000s, right when dating apps were starting to become more mainstream. I remember back then, I was an early adapter of dating apps. I thought they were interesting, but 
I remember back in the day, there was still a stigma about them, like only losers were on dating apps, people who couldn't get a girlfriend or a boyfriend in real life. And it's interesting because like Manhattan was Tinder before Tinder existed. It's like Manhattan has a reputation for, especially for women, for finding it, it's a place that's very difficult to get into a committed relationship. Because yes, you're great. I like that you make six figures, you have a nice jawline, but maybe you come in blonde and he's probably just three blocks away at the next bar, so nice to meet you. So that kind of fast-paced um, pickiness has dominated a lot of concentrated urban markets for a while, but now it's everywhere. Because of social media and dating apps, people functionally have access to every single and not so single person on the planet, which has completely changed the dating game. It's like a man now has to compete on some level with every other man on earth for the girl next door. And women have to compete on some level with every other woman on the planet for the most eligible bachelor in their like little town. Like it's not enough to be a big fish in a small pond anymore. There are no small ponds anymore. It's just one gigantic ocean. And that's why there's just a few enormous whales that are gobbling up the vast amount of opportunity. I've thought about that a lot about the, I'm sure you've heard of Dunbar's number. Mm -hmm. We're only able to process like 150 different social relationships in yeah. our head. But now we're exposed to just this infinite amount of people and infinite amount of different peoples and regions, different problems. So that like empathetic problem solving part of our brain kind of wants to help people. But then we're becoming like too empathetic in kind of a way. Our empathy is being used too much, but we're also desiring everything that everyone else has. So we're becoming more jealous and more uh, of a, a craving type of people. And one comment on the dating apps is when twin Tinder first came out in Japan, I gave it a shot and I was using it for a little while. And then I came across this one woman's profile and she said, I'm just here to see how many people think I'm hot. Actually, I think guys who use dating apps are just guy are just losers who can't do pickup. And I was like, wow, okay. Wow. I mean, there is some evidence to back that up. Uh, I think the most common reason women use dating apps is boredom. It's not to, out of an interest to actually meet another human being in real life. It's something that gives them a little hit of dopamine and validation because they know that somebody out there likes them. And that also makes it harder for them to settle for any present actual opportunity because like, there's no urgency. I don't have to get into a relationship now. I can wait until I find someone potentially even better because look, there are 500 boys, 500 men who think that I'm attractive. So like, there's no hurry. I can exercise that optionality whenever I like. What do you think it does to women's psychology? Because in the past, there was probably only a certain number of men, you know, before dating apps who are going to muster up the courage and go and talk to that woman. Mm -hmm. So she probably only got this really low amount of validation on the daily or the weekly of like, oh, okay, this number of guys think I'm attractive. Okay, that's nice. But now, like you said, it's like you can get 500 likes pretty quickly. Well, sure. I mean, the social media game, I think, has incentivized certain personality traits over others. And we can certainly say that there's probably a rise in narcissism because of this in both men and women, though narcissism tends to get expressed in different ways between the two genders. Um, women tend to be, we can say, somatic narcissists, and they get their validation in feeling desired for their body and being an attractive sexual option which is no small thing. I mean, when a girl says that she thinks that I'm cute, it makes my day a little brighter. I, I get it. So why don't we talk a little bit about that, about the kind of differences between men and women and how some understandings arise. For example, sorry, some misunderstandings arise. So for example, you had a video about how women, men don't realize that women enjoy emotion, even if it's not positive. 
Like mm. there can, like it, uh, I think you said negative, even negative emotion can be reassuring or reinforcing, mm -hmm. I think was the word you used. Yeah, I think I s talked about that in one of my episodes about why women pick fights, I think is the name of the episode. And often women will pick fights and be intentionally provocative because getting angry is a sign that you still care. If, if you are completely uninvested in a relationship, you're just going to express indifference to something that is annoying or inconvenient and you'll withdraw even further. Sometimes provoking a fight is actually a last ditch attempt, but often a counterproductive one to reunite the dyad in question. Uh, it just, it, I think it, it generally can do that, but not indefinitely. And especially if the only way a woman can feel like she has sufficient validation of the emotional investment of the man in question is by picking a fight, that relationship is going to go down south very quickly because that man will be unintentionally reinforcing that woman's provocation because he's basically rewarding her provocation with renewed emotional engagement. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, not, that's gonna get worse way before it gets better. And one of the things that we learned from John Gottman's lab when he was studying, let's say, micro emotions, so these small transacted emotions that are communicated between men and women in relationships, is that to stay together, there needs to be at least, at least five positive emotional interactions for every one negative one. Like that's the minimum ratio. So if it's just like as bad as it is good, that's not worth it. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. And I think, yeah. And I think that's because pain is more painful than pleasure is pleasurable. So like one unit of pain, according to this ratio, might be five times more intense than one unit of pleasure, one unit of positive interaction. They also found, however, that there's a cap to that. Like if there's more than I think 12 or 13 positive interactions for every one negative interaction, like if the relationship is too positive and there's no negativity, people get bored and people get disinterested. So you, the sweet spot, according to Gottman, is definitely erring on the side of positive emotionality, but to not completely eliminate the negative dimension entirely. So one thing that I thought of when you mentioned that negative emotion can be reinforcing for women, mm -hmm. could that generate a situation where, say, a man being too willing to like fight about something? I've, I've, I've seen this with myself several years ago with ex-girlfriends, there might be a fight and I think the fight's over, but then she still wants to discuss more and more and more. And then I'm thinking like, oh, you know, I'm clearly in a bad mood. This is really uncomfortable for her, for me. It must be uncomfortable for her. Not necessarily. Okay. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm confused is why it's going on so long. So is there a situation where the man doesn't realize that what he thinks is a stick is actually a carrot for her? Uh, certainly, yeah, because uh, you're mentioning sticks and carrots, which is a framework that I use. Obviously, I didn't invent that to stand for uh, punishments and rewards, right? And if you take those terms from behavioral psychology, we actually don't know which one is which until we see the outcome. Like for example, parents figure this out real quickly with children. If a child misbehaves and they think, well, I'm gonna punish that kid by sending him to his room. But then when he gets into his room, he knocks everything off the shelves, kicks the wall and starts making an even bigger ruckus than before, that wasn't punishing. That actually made the situation worse. So what we think is a punishment might actually be a reinforcer and vice versa. A punishment is only something that decreases the frequency of a target behavior. And we don't know that something is a punishment until it actually does that. 
and a reward or reinforcer is only something that increases the frequency of a target behavior. And we only know what that is after we observe its effect on the individual in question. So some things are more or less carrots or sticks to everybody. But remember, there's some people who like to get whipped for fun. You know what I'm saying? They, they will pay people exorbitant sums of money to step on them and to do all kinds of degrading and painful things. So like even humiliation and physical torment can be carrots to certain people. That's how confusing we, ha we happen to be. Hmm. So if you are in, let's say you're arguing with someone. Well, you should never really argue with somebody, dude. There's really no point. Yeah. I, I'm kind of referring to myself of about like eight years ago, my ex-girlfriend would be getting mad. So I would kind of match the anger. Yeah, it's easy. Right? It's easy to get sucked into that emotional frame. Yeah. It's like this, it, you're in the, it's the atmosphere in the room. Emotion is in some way contagious and it takes a great deal of, you know, you have to be very centered, you have to be very mindful and self-possessed to resist the pull to enter into, let's say an emotional narrative that's being offered to you in a personally relevant relationship. It's easy to do it if you don't have a relationship where you don't care about the person, but it happens unconsciously. The more mindful and self-possessed that you are, the less likely you're gonna be sucked into that. But every, myself included, I've made that mistake mm -hmm. a bunch of mm -hmm. times. And do you think that is, uh, could that stem from like a, a willing, not enough willingness to assert boundaries? Because at some point you just gotta say, okay, here's a situation, I don't want that to happen again. And if you do, that crosses the boundary, so here'll be the consequence mm -hmm. of well, crossing the boundary, that's it. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about boundaries and then I'll answer what I think is your real question, which is how, do, how should you respond to, to that? So boundaries is a relationship word. Therapists love to talk about boundaries. And boundaries are necessary for relationships. But a lot of people, misunderstand what boundaries are. Most people think that a boundary is something that I tell you, don't do this anymore, and you listen to me. Okay, it's like, my boundary is you should not raise your voice to me. You're, and when you raise your voice to me, I, I say, you're violating my boundary, why would you do that, right? Okay, so that's not actually how boundaries work, and we don't want them to work that way, because if they did, you're basically divesting yourself of any power and control of the situation. You're saying that the best I can do is request that you stop doing something and I'm not actually in control of you or your behavior, right? So it's a little bit disempowering to the person who's trying to enforce the boundary. A boundary is really not about the other person's behavior. A boundary is about your behavior, namely your behavioral response to a a certain behavior in the other person. A boundary could look something like this, which is, hey, you know, you're a different, you're gonna do what you're gonna do. However, if you choose to raise your voice at me again, I will choose to leave this relationship. That's it. Now, to the, ex to the extent, this works to the extent that it's not so much that you have to, that I have to trust that you're never gonna yell at me. You just have to trust that I'm gonna leave you if you do. That's the deterrence that keeps boundaries like borders between countries clean. You step over this line, there will be consequences. And you just have to believe that I'm not bluffing and you'll stay on your side of the fence. And this doesn't have to be a long drawn out conversation. This could be a 30 second conversation. I, 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 I teach men to have 30 second conversations with their girlfriends and wives, oftentimes around like infidelity. A lot of men are concerned about cheating and infidelity, women too. And a 30 second conversation goes something like this. Hey, sweetheart, I just want you to know that if you ever cheat on me, I will eventually find out. And when I do, it will immediately end our relationship. No questions asked. Do you understand? Yes? Great, I hope we never have to talk about this again. Do you, do you feel like that often has to be said? I kind of, I kind of thought it was like yeah. a given. Well, I mean, it, it does need to be said because in today's day and age, sex always precedes commitment. 
you're kind of in a situationship until you decide to consciously define the relationship. N nobody who goes out on a first date realistically expects that the only person that that other person is talking to, dating, and or sleeping with. So things exist in a gray zone until the expectations for the relationship are defined. Like relationships need definitions, they need rules, they need boundaries, uh, because they're basically a like a business arrangement. Speaking of business arrangements, is the the definition of a boundary, right? It's like having a contract where you say like, the other party shall not do this exactly. without writing what the actual consequence, like if there's a fine, will be of, of them doing that. Sure, that's what keeps society civil. Like, let me tell you, there's plenty of people who would become murderers if they weren't aware that the consequence of being caught for that crime is is death or a life imprisonment. It's like you don't hide the consequences for the crime. If you did, people might not, there'll be a lot more murders, I'll tell you that. You know what I'm saying? If people didn't know the consequences of murders, there would be a lot more. But as many crimes of passion as there are, even when people are just about to completely lose it, they find a way to hold on because they remember what the consequence is going to be. Without that recognition of the con or awareness of the consequence, there would be a lot more bad behavior. And we can see that in relationships as well, when people don't know what the consequences of bad behavior are. And also, we, we can't always agree what bad behavior is. What's bad behavior for you might be completely normal in my family, culture, my previous relationships, and vice versa. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm fucked up or and, and you're normal and, or vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was a probably a reason why there was public hangings in the past. <laughs> yeah, and they always had a the sign that said the crime around the, the person's neck. Right. So you'd fucking know what that guy did. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's what happens if I do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But imagine, it's like the first guy who committed a murder. It, it, would, it would be sort of like, you know, he got caught. And I would think that it might be very unfair, whatever. You might think it would be very unfair, whatever punishment they levied about. Again, it's like, well, I, I didn't know that this was going to be the, the consequence of that. I mean, the first murder, I guess, would be, you know, Cain and Abel in the Bible. And I'd, I wonder if uh, Cain would have done what he did if he knew that he was going to be thrown out of paradise and, uh, you know, live a lifetime of toil and sweat and pain and effort as a consequence. Maybe he would have had some self-restraint in that moment. <laughs> Who knows? That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, let me see, I'm, I'm trying to circle back to that question I asked about, like what do you see as the most common problem uh, that you're finding popping up? Like is there a kind of common thread that is intersecting the relationship problems you're seeing with your male clients? Kind of like a, a lack of this trait or a lack of that trait or too much of this trait or maybe misled by this. Well, I do talk, I, I made a couple episodes recently about men and women's biggest enemies. Mm -hmm. And the way I see it in today's sexual marketplace, women's greatest enemy is their pride and men's greatest enemy is their cowardice. And that cowardice because you asked about men, is expressed in a number of different ways from just I'm too terrified to approach a woman or to express my sexual attraction to I am too terrified to, because of its social implications, to take the lead in this relationship and or, and or to be the head of the family. That that's uh, potentially oppressive, that that is sexist, that that is a deviation from the 50-50 relationship of the way that things should look in an equitable partnership. I mean, a partnership is already kind of a, it's a word that carries a lot of difficult connotations because it does suggest that kind of like 50-50 thing. Mm -hmm. And most women don't want a 50-50 thing. Most women want a relationship that significantly improves their lives because they can get that. What do you think they mean by 50-50 then? Like some part of them has to know that they want, they're like, I want a, a husband who's disproportionately better than me 
but the relationship needs to be 50 50 like what, what do you think is the expectation well, the expectation is that i want 50 50 share in sort of the decision making mm -hmm. and let's say i want to be an equal stakeholder when it comes to vote but i don't necessarily want to have an equal share of the responsibilities for governing, maintaining, directing, and executing the relationship. And this is tricky. I mean, it's kind of why in the United States, we have two branches of Congress. We have the Senate and the House of Representatives. In the Senate, every state has two senators. So that way, the big states don't just completely make the small states irrelevant. But that's ridiculous. So you can't have a state like Wyoming, which has less than a million people, have equal, completely equal parity with a state like California that has I don't know, like 50 times the number of people. That would be incredibly unfair, be disproportionately, it would make Wyoming disproportionately powerful and California disproportionately um, powerless. So you need both. Like there is a sense that men and women are equal partners and should be treated as such, but there is a sense that you know he or she who pays the piper calls the tune. And if you're investing more in the relationship, you should have a greater say in the decision-making of that relationship. Like both things are true. Now how to navigate that in a relationship is very difficult. We do it in Congress by actually having different people fulfill those different roles in different branches of Congress. Um, so it's tricky to do when, if, if it was just a, a unicameral a Congress as opposed to a bicameral. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing that I, I did mention in that episode is that once I personally made the decision that I was gonna move forward in my interactions with women in a romantic context, in the sense that I was no longer going to be interested in, in figuring out what they want. This is gonna sound bad, but kind of like what they want is irrelevant. I need to be clear about what I want, and I need to be on my mission and about creating and manifesting that in my life. And to the extent that I'm successful, I will have an emotionally compelling lifestyle, I will have a successful career, I will have a high status profession, I will be happy personally, I'll be healthy, I'll be like in my, I'll be thriving because I'm doing what works for me and what I know that I, and manifesting what I know that I want. And I make that visible to other women. And then women get to kind of self-select in or not. And a lot of women, they're gonna see that and they're gonna be like, nope, it's not exactly what I want or that's not at all what I want and they'll just pass me by, it's totally fine. But the idea that I'm gonna go through all of that work just so that I can surrender it over to a woman who might just show up is, I mean, that's absurd, that's never going to happen. So I'm very much in the driver's seat in my relationships. And I allow, and like the door is always open. So at any time this doesn't work, you can you can leave. But like, you're the passenger. I'm the driver because I built the car. I know how to drive it. I know how it operates better than anybody. Um, so as long as this works for you, let's let's drive together. But I'm not a taxi cab. You don't just get to show up and tell me where we're going. Like that's that makes you disproportionately powerful. Does that make sense? And I think it took some courage on my part to basically say, I'm foregoing the strategy of trying to enter into a sexual relationship with a woman by catering to her desires, which I think is what most guys start off doing because on some level, that's what Hollywood or their culture teaches them, or that's kind of the misguided advice that they get from other women or uh, the men in their lives who often don't know what they're doing either. Yeah, that, that was uh, my misconception up until probably say my early 20s was assuming, oh, I just have to like make her the purpose. Oh, no, then, don't do that. <laughs> it, was like, it was like, make her the purpose, like respect goes down <laughs> and it well, did not when, work out. Because women don't really want to be the center of your life. That is also way too much power for them. And you'd have to kind of already be somewhat narcissistic to desire that amount of power. 
And so there's some women out there, there's some men out there who desire that kind of, uh, that degree of control over other people. Um, but no, they, they want to, they want to be able to like look up to a man and that man is generally looking at something else. That man is generally looking at something else, not down at the woman. Yeah, I hear that's supposed to be one of the one of the effective dating profile pictures is basically you have a guy looking at the camera and then you have an adoring woman looking up at him and that's supposed to be really effective. Oh man, it's like profile all picture. the old <laughs> Hollywood posters yeah. used to do this before we got um, infected with wokeism. Like look at the old Star Wars poster. Do you remember that one? Can Wasn't you picture it in your mind? between his legs he, on the floor? Yep. And that's his sister, you know? And so Leia's like <laughs> curled around one of Luke's legs looking up at him. And Luke has the phallic lightsaber and he's looking up at the stars. And it's like, th that's a posture that existed in almost every action adventure movie yeah. from that era. Yeah, yeah. So there's been kind of like a, a, a gradient ramping us up to the current wokeness. Mm -hmm. And I think along the way was a lot of this kind of like, oh, men, you should, you're not supposed to be stronger, better, uh, more competent, whatever, than a woman. You're supposed to be equal. And so do you think that has something to do with men's lack of courage? Like like they were talked out of being cour oh, courageous? Yeah. Surely, surely there's all these other peripheral factors. Like if you're watching porn all the time, you never have to muster up the courage to actually talk to a woman. Or if you have a dating app, you know, you, you're just like there and, and you can, which is fine, you, which is you kind of have to do it nowadays. But it's well, like, I mean, yeah, from a very young age, I was taught men and women are equal. Men and women are equal. Men and women are equal. And that can be interpreted as in many, many different ways. The, the correct interpretation, in my opinion, is to understand like the way that we use that language in, say, the Declaration of Independence, which is that all man all men, like the human race, men and women, all men are created equal. Like we're all equal before some sort of higher authority. That from a spiritual level, no one person's life has more value or dignity than any other person's life. But when we get down to, to this earthly realm where people have to make decisions using limited resources, some people are absolutely more valuable than others. And that depends on your goals. It's like if your toilet is clogged, a plumber is much more valuable than a cardiologist in that moment. Do you understand? And even among all plumbers, some are going to be more valuable than others to you. Someone's going to have, you know, this one has 85 star reviews. This one has two. This one is three times more expensive. This one is more affordable. So it's like there's going to be better options for you given your resources and your goals at the present moment. Okay. So, I think when you teach kids that men and women are equal, what they often hear is that men and women are the same because that's another interpretation of equality. Like when we say one plus two equals three, we're basically saying that those two mathematical propositions are interchangeable, that we can, we can commute them around and we don't lose any truth. That statement is the same backwards and forwards. That's what equality is from a logical perspective, right? And so I think what that has potentially done culturally is kind of made men more feminine and women more masculine. Mm. And I believe that that has made, that has created some opportunities for the sexual marketplace, but it's mostly created confusion and liabilities. And do you think that makes us kind of like less attracted to each other? Because me personally, I don't sure. want a more masculine woman. Yeah. So sometimes there's this failure of intersex understanding. So for example, like we were talking about earlier, to the extent that it's true that women find men who are wealthy and professionally successful attractive, or more attractive than men who are less wealthy and less successful, all other things being equal, then they might think, oh, well, if I find that attractive in a man, then perhaps a man will find that attractive in me. So I'm gonna prioritize becoming high powered and high earning mm -hmm. and high status. And 
combine that with the idea that I'm looking for my equal, um, these women who pursue that path are often not very successful in the sexual marketplace. Because generally by the time they're able to get access to those equally powerful high status men, they're much older. Mm -hmm. And those powerful high status men don't want to wife up women in their late 30s or early 40s, especially if they can get someone much younger who is a more attractive reproductive option. Right. Do you think that the corollary of that is men saying, I'm sure there's a lot of corollaries, but is men saying, oh, if I'm more expressive with my emotions and I reveal my emotions more, she's going to like that because that's what women like. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. And men are told to, to be more vulnerable, to be more emotional express, emotionally expressive, uh, to be more caring. Um, and, you know, on taking that to extreme, they often, there's a subgroup of, you know, the current discourse that also calls traditional male qualities of like stoicism uh, and, res, you know, that kind of emotional resilience to be toxic, uh, that it's bad for men. And I, I could, and there, there might be some degree of truth to it. It's like, I know men who are so removed from their own emotions that they wouldn't know if they were feeling anything, if it came up and slapped them in the face, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that they've practiced repressing their emotions for so long that they've completely on some level lost access to that dimension of their self, yeah. which is kind of sad. I can see that. But if there's an alternative between that man and the man who's spilling his purse all over the place, I, I think it's probably best, at least in terms of his success in the sexual marketplace, for him to be the former than the latter. Yeah, we, we were talking about this off camera and I was mentioning how after a couple of meditation retreats, it was like, um, you know, I, I don't think I would really say that I was a person who couldn't read their own emotions, but after the meditation retreats, it's like they came out in high def mm -hmm. and it wasn't like that made me more emotional per se, but it was just, I could, I could see them a lot clearly, more clearly. And so that I want to say that led to better decisions. I think you pointed out that, um, when people are making decisions, there's actual emotional component of it, right? Of like course. the, like the emotional part of the brain is what gives you this signal that this is the decision. Uh, yes, I can talk about that. There are many models for masculinity. One of my personal favorites is one of the Japanese samurai. I love the I archetype of the Japanese samurai because not only is he strong and selfless and stoic and long suffering and resilient, he also has enough sensitivity to be able to write a haiku about the cherry blossoms and to be moved by the beauty of the transient seizing, seasons. And on some level, it's like, yeah, that's, that's correct. It's like, why be so strong and tough if it means destroying the thing inside of you that that strength and toughness was designed to protect? Which unfortunately is the, like the victim in so many men's lives is they, they choke off or, or completely repress that sensitivity that should be defended and protected as much as like women and children on some level in traditional masculinity. And by cutting that off, you, you cut off a, a great deal of the richness and, and joy in life and experience. So I think, I think that's a really good model. And no one would think that a, a samurai is soft, you know what I'm saying, for being into poetry and flowers. I mean, you've got guys who are like, okay, it's my time to die, so I'm going to disembowel myself. Holy like, shit. <laughs> you just have like the epitome of balls of steel. Yeah. The fact that people could do that is, it's, it de almost defies belief. Like the, the amount of strength and concentration and commitment to honor, mm -hmm. you know, because I think that if, if they didn't go through it, they would just be dishonorably slaughtered. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how many people on death row would, would necessarily kill themselves even if given any option. It's like, it's still, even if you have one day left, if you have one minute left, 
it would be hard, I think, for a lot of people to hasten the process if you're still healthy, right. if you're still intact. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, a little morbid. But um, to, so your question is about um, how emotions facilitate decisions. Okay, yeah, this is real interesting. So one of the primary functions of emotions is to serve as a decision-making heuristic. We know this because sometimes, because of usually tumors, we have to excise the limbic systems, which are the, the seat of emotional processing in the brain, in individuals. You can live without the limbic system. Like it's not essential to human functioning. Um, but it does really change that person's life. Like they continue to live and breathe as an organism. Their personality is often more or less the same, but their decision-making, among other things, totally goes off the rails. So you put one of these people in like the cereal aisle of a supermarket and they will spend hours without making a decision because they will be comparing how this box of cereal is two cents cheaper per gram than this one, but this one actually has three grams more niacin than this one, so maybe the cost per gram is offset by the increase in niacin, but this one over here has a flavor ratio that on this rate is better than this. It's like they, they, just, they just are overwhelmed with information. And the fact of the matter is that the mind cannot decide. Decision is like, an act of the will, which is more associated with emotion than with, let's say, cognition, pure cognition. If we're being really honest about what the mind can do, the mind is sort of like a, uh, it's a really, it's a really powerful organic computer that is calculating all of these billions and billions of valuations on a number of different levels beneath the threshold of awareness. And what it can basically do is we're gonna put this information in to this model with these sort of assumptions, and it will spit out the likelihood of predicted success associated with various scenarios, which is sort of like, okay, given these assumptions and this data, the mind can tell you that this has an 83% chance of being a satisfying outcome, whereas this alternative possibility has a 72%, something like that. Now, if you then were to ask the mind, well, should I do this? The mind is going to say, I don't fucking know. This one will have an 82% chance of success. This one will have a chance. It's like, well, what should I do? Again, I don't fucking know. I just, I'm a computer. I just crunch the numbers. Do you understand? It's like talking to, uh, you know, a real estate agent or a stockbroker, and they're trying to explain the finances, and you say, well, w what should I do? They're not going to tell you, partly because they don't want to be responsible for the decision, right? But it's like, it's it's your money. I'm just here to kind of explain the market or explain what the options are, and you have to make the decision, okay? So what happens generally is that the brain calculates all of those odds ratios beneath the threshold of awareness, and that, like, probability kind of gets transmuted into a, an emotion in normal people. So a normal person doesn't spend hours in the cereal aisle. They walk down until they see Lucky Charms and they just throw it into their cart because they're like, oh, Lucky Charms, I like this one. That liking is the transmuted result of all of these billions and billions of unconscious calculations that are going on under the surface. But if you take away the emotion, you just have the billions and billions of calculations and information overload, which leads to analysis paralysis. So people who are more divorced from their emotions have a much more difficult time making decisions. Mm -hmm. That's uh, it's really interesting because it ties back into the whole masculinity thing because I would imagine that most women do not like an indecisive guy. It's true. No it's one like, wants a wishy-washy dude. Right? And so it's funny because the samurai, excellent archetype of what it is to be masculine. Uh, meditation was a big part of the thing. Sure. And one thing, as I mentioned earlier, one thing I really didn't expect from meditation was that it would make me a better decision maker. And I think, and I think it, that it has a lot to do with that being able to read emotions. Do you, do you have anything else to say about the overexpressing emotions? One thing to know your emotions and be able to read them, but then there's another thing to express them haphazardly, right? Yeah. 
you got to be careful about expressing emotions as a man, especially to a woman that you're in a relationship with. I made a video a long time ago called The Captain Can't Complain. And the metaphor here is that as the man, you are the captain of the relationship. You are driving the car, to use that metaphor from earlier. Now, now your woman could be your first mate, which is a really important position on the ship, but is still slightly below the captain in the hierarchy. If one day the first mate were to come into the captain's quarters and say, hey, Cap, how's everything? And the captain turns around and says, oh, man, I don't know if we're going to make it. You know, I'm really concerned. I think that there are some pirates on our tail and they're catching up to us and we're heading right into a shoal and I don't have a fucking map. I mean, we're running low on supplies. I, I, I just am so overwhelmed and stressed out. I don't even know what to do. I mean, that first mate is going to like... Okay, um, get it together, and if it's so bad, she might be looking for the first chance to get off that boat, you know what I'm saying? So captains need to be very careful about communicating certain emotions to their first mate or their crew, because they're not at the same level, and we don't, we expect different responsibilities at different levels because the different levels also come with different privileges. There's privileges associated with being a captain, but one of the responsibilities is you have to keep your shit together. Otherwise, we, we can't have you in that position of leadership and power and, because that's going to destabilize this entire enterprise, right? So that said, the, if the first mate were to come in under those circumstances and say, hey, Cap, how's it going? And the captain turned around and said, everything's fine. Just fine. Like, that's bullshit. And when the pirates catch up or they run ashore, the first mate's going to be like, "What? I thought everything was fine. What's going on? Now we're in deep shit. So what the captain needs to do is to acknowledge the reality situation and then provide a realistic, actionable pathway forward. Like, basically in the next breath, which could mean something like, we have a number of challenges in store for us. There are pirates that we're gonna be dealing with. We're gonna be moving through uncharted territories that haven't been mapped yet. We're all gonna to need to be on our A game for this. But if you are at the helm with the light and doing this and other people are stationed at the back, ready to defend us, like we might be able to get through this alive. Are you with me? And they'll be like, yeah, because that's probably their best possible chance of surviving that situation. So, the captain in that case was able to admit the reality of certain circumstances without like falling prey to the fear that those circumstances may have provoked in someone with less self-possession mm -hmm. and to respond to them in a reality-based and hopefully effective way. Like that's how you navigate challenges as a leader. I, I don't want to misremember or misquote her TED talk. I think Brene Brown wrote this talk about the importance of vulnerability. And I feel like that was right around the time when this idea of emotional vulnerability is going to heal us all. And we need to be emotionally vulnerable to process um, our negative emotions or something like that. What do you think about this idea of emotional vulnerability as a means to become a better person? Yeah, vulnerability is a tough word. I, I really dislike the word because etymologically, it comes from the same root as wound. Yeah. Oh. Like uh, weakness, right? It's, it's where, where I, I it's where I've been wounded. wounded. That's my vulnerability. Or I guess it's where I could be wounded, right? Um and so why would you go around advertising that information? Because not everybody is trustworthy and not everybody is on your side. That would be like Achilles on a first date thinking that he's trying to be vulnerable, saying, hey, you know, I kind of hate to admit it, but I'm a little soft around the ankles, you know? It's like, why would he do that? <laughs> um, so vulnerability is tricky. She's not necessarily wrong in my understanding, but here's the issue. It's like, because of some of the experiences I had when I was younger, and also because of all of the work that I've done to accept process and heal, I can talk about some of the really painful and challenging parts of my life in a frank 
and non-defensive and open way. And as a therapist, that can actually help people. Like for example, if you were an alcoholic, you would kind of want your sponsor to be a recovered alcoholic, as opposed to somebody who's like never had a drink, might be moralistic or judgmental and has read, you know, these are effective interventions from a book. Like, fuck that. You know, I wouldn't want to follow that guy because that guy wouldn't really know the condition inside and out. And I couldn't trust that he could get out of that situation. But a recovered sponsor, you know, recovery is a, is a constant, never-ending process, but they found a way out of the hell of addiction. So it's like, yeah, I want to follow that person. That might not necessarily work for me, but it's clearly worked for someone, at least one person. So let's, let's follow him. The issue is that that sponsor's alcoholism is only useful to the extent that he's gone through the process of healing and recovering from it. Now, when a lot of people make emotional disclosures under the auspices of being vulnerable, they haven't actually really processed, healed, or accepted that part of themselves. It's still like an open wound. And so, like if I were to share some things from my past and somebody mocked me, which sometimes happens. It's like sometimes I talk about relationships on the, on the channel and I talk about how I've had many different kinds of relationships with many different kinds of women. And some people will, will use that information to, to attack me. It's like, well, if this guy knew what he was doing, why would he have so many relationships, okay? Um, and if I, wasn't like at peace on some level with my relationship history, that might hurt, but it doesn't. Because I have accepted that certain relationships were useful for a time and they were useful for certain lessons. I've learned those lessons and I've moved on. Does that make sense? Yep. A lot of times people, when being vulnerable, are treating the other person like a priest or like a confessor which is I want to put these, and this is actually a, a male romantic fantasy that I fell prey to when I was younger, which is I want to put all of my failings and weaknesses um, and flaws at your feet, milady, so that you can tell me that I'm still good enough, that you can tell me that you still love me despite all of these things. Tell me, like, look at these 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 bad things things about me or look at these uh, these less than attractive or desirable things and tell me that you can see past them. Tell me that it's okay, which is basically like treating the woman like a god, which is, oh, you know, Jesus, I, I'm a, this terrible sinner, but please, you know, save me. Please, please love me anyway on some level. Um, and women don't operate that way. They're not divine. A lot of them um, are still healing themselves. So you can really only be vulnerable if the wound is now a scar. It's, if it's still open and festering, you should probably tend to that. But once it's healed over, that scar is a great story and potentially a lesson to be learned that I could share with other people. That's, that's an interesting point. I think it's safe to say that a lot of women, I don't know about nowadays, but it was certainly a theme for a long time. Women like scars. Sure. But I doubt they like festering wounds. Nobody, Nobody likes a festering that. wound. <laughs> <laughs> but a scar it's means that, uh, it doesn't always mean, but the, the, I guess the association with scars is that you were brave. You faced some sort of physical danger. Uh, you were healthy and strong and resilient enough to get through it as well. It makes you more interesting. On some level, when I was younger, I, I felt like I was a magnet for pain and suffering. Like I had a tough time in my adolescence and young adulthood. And it took me a long time to figure out why. But when you understand why you're in pain, the pain goes away. It significantly lessens once you understand the source of the pain. And as I acquired more and more understanding into the origins and maintenance of that pain, the pain decreased and I was able to heal a lot of those wounds. And now, many, many years later, in retrospect, I can see that some of those darkest moments 
of hopelessness and suffering were some of the greatest gifts that I've ever been given because I was able to survive them, heal them, and show other people I've been there. I know what that is like. I've felt and experienced that myself, and there's a way out. I never thought that my suffering would be useful to other people. Do you think it's part of why you became a psychologist? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like there's there's so many different traditions that have this kind of theme of growth through suffering. I know even in uh, the Buddhist scriptures, they say that to they have this long chain of what is necessary to attain enlightenment. And it's kind of explaining the mental states that you go in into throughout the meditation in kind of a minor and macro level. And I'll say like to have focus, you need, I'm, I'm getting them out of order, but like to have focus, you need to have joy. So you have to be in a good mental state to have the focus necessary to develop deep enough meditation and so on and so on. And then once it gets closer to the awakening moment, the they're a lot more abstract and kind of like harder to talk about. But it says it all starts with uh, a proper desire. And then the first link before that is the suffering or the pain. But it's it's a could be also interpreted as dissatisfaction. It's this. Well, I like pain way. better, but you know maybe yeah. they mean dissatisfaction. But a pain is just more real and honest to me than dissatisfaction. Pain is real and immediate, and I was in pain. And there's a lot of people who are in urgent, immediate pain that are looking for some kind of any kind of relief, which is a big part of why we have such a big. Uh, so, so many social problems like pornography and addiction and social media it's ways to anesthetize pain in, in a lot of cases now that process sounds really complicated effortful and time consuming right mm -hmm. so who in their right mind would fucking do that if they didn't have to you know what i'm saying so of course the pain has to come first because nothing is more motivating than pain. Misery is motivating. This is, this is an interesting little fact. According to a study I read a long time ago, the single, the factor that is most associated with patient improvement in a psychotherapy context is there in presenting misery. It's like, the more miserable a person is when they first enter a therapist's office, the more likely they're going to get better. I see. I see. And we can understand that from a number of different perspectives. It could be just regression towards the mean. They come in at a really, really low point. It's probably more likely they're going to get better than get even worse. But hell is bottomless, as Jordan Peterson talks about. So you can always get worse, unfortunately. Um, but it could also mean that they are finally motivated enough to fucking take action and and change their own behavior and change the way they're living and make different choices. It's like a miserable situation is kind of unsustainable. You'll either die or you'll grow. That's why one of the most dangerous things for people is like a good enough situation. Like a B life, a B minus life is probably on the long run worse for people than a D plus life because no one's gonna stay in a D-plus life for very long if they can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. They will do something necessary to get out because they are in acute, urgent, intense pain. Whereas the B-minus person is not. And a B-minus is higher than a C. So like the regression towards the mean works against them. Like all things being equal, there are, it could get worse than better. There are fewer better outcomes. But a B-minus life is like standing on 16 in blackjack. Like, oh, that's uh, hard to, oh, 16 is tough. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, of course. And it's kind of scary when you think about how we've gotten more and more pacifying things. So, for example, it's like, oh, everything sucks, but, hey, you know, I got Netflix and I can do this. Or, well, I've got Netflix and porn, I guess. <laughs> well, I was noticing that because we're here in, in Japan, right? And I'm, I was taking the Tokyo subway just yesterday and every single person is on their smartphone. Oh, yeah. 
every single person. And I noticed a judgment inside of me that came up. It's like, oh, look at this. Everyone is just glued to their screens. But then I had another judgment that followed that, which was, look at how peaceful and tranquil it is in this car, mm-hmm. where you have maybe you know, 100 people crammed into just a few cubic meters and they're not elbowing each other and they're not pushing each other around or getting annoyed at it. It's like, maybe we need those screens oh, yeah. to be able to live <laughs> in harmony in such close quarters with other people, you know? Yeah. I don't have to look at your ugly, sweaty face. I can look at my screen right. instead and that's gonna get me through the situation. Right, right. Speaking of Japan, so you this is your third time here? Uh, technically, this is my one, two, three, four, fifth time, fifth time here. Okay. Do you notice anything? Um, I mean, I don't know if that's enough uh, reference point to to make a judgment for you, but like, do you notice anything different in terms of like interpersonal dynamics or on the themes that we've been talking about? Well, I mean, it's hugely different, right? Um, I think... I mean, you're the you're more of an expert than than me in this regard, for sure. You've lived here for so long, but okay, yeah, that's true. So maybe you know certain things are going to be more striking for me, for the contrast. Um, there is so much emphasis paid to respect, both interpersonally and just for like the law. Like people don't even jaywalk here when there's no cars visible in any direction, which goes against every instinct inside of me as a New Yorker to sit there and obey a mechanical light that clearly is irrelevant to this present situation. Um, But I do that here mostly because it's like it contributes to the sort of tranquility of that urban environment one of the things I love about Tokyo is that you can be, you can have these intense urban centers. You can be like at the Shibuya Scramble where there's just thousands of people fighting for a space on the sidewalk, but three blocks over and you have a quiet residential neighborhood and you can hear crickets. You can even see the stars sometimes in the middle of Tokyo. So they have a really good way of maintaining that balance between the humane and the natural with let's say the urbane and the unnatural that I find really interesting. It's like not every square centimeter is devoted to office space like you might find in Manhattan. When you work with a lot of uh, non-Japanese people in a foreign capital company, you get an interesting perspective because you hear a lot of people complaining about like, I'm trying to offer this deal to so-and-so, like our product is clearly so much better and it's cheaper, but you know the client just wants to stick with so and so because they've been with them for fifteen years. So it's like there's the values pop up here and there. It's like oh, you know, you would be cheaper and your product is a little better, but I've got this relationship that I've been on for fifteen years, and of course that happens in both contexts. But I just feel like it's, it happens a lot more in Japan. I think in a business context, sure, but that analysis happens all the time in committed relationships and marriages, which is if you're together, let's say for 40 years, over that timeline, you will meet somebody who is interested in you that you might be more attracted to than your current partner, that on certain metrics might be a better option than your current partner. Do sometimes people leave their current partners for those more attractive, better options? Yes, they do but they have to be significantly better to justify the pain and the cost of moving from one to the other. If, it's, if the other option is just to use the business analogy just a little bit cheaper and just a little bit better, then in the balance of things, the, the good and constructed relationship that I've developed over the 15 years with the other company is probably more valuable to me than the marginal improvements in sa- you know, saving costs and quality of product. Does that make sense? Yeah. But if it was significantly cheaper and significantly better and solved a host of problems that this other one doesn't without creating new ones, that becomes more irrational to defend, right? To not make the switch. 
And people will say it's just business, and they're right. If you say, and, and they'll do that when in their marriages, and they're, it's for the same reason. They can't say it's just business. That would be cold and callous, but it's kind of the same thing. As they make this determination that the benefits associated with switching sides have so significantly surpassed the benefits associated with staying here that I can't not do this on some level. Which reminds me of something you've said a couple times, I think of, uh, it, I think it was uh, relationships are the medium in which you exchange value. R relationships are the medium in which value is transacted. Yeah, that's basically what my book is about. Yeah, and where no value is transacted, no relationship exists. Could you elaborate on a little bit more? Sure. So people want things from other people. And people functionally represent both a problem and a solution to that wanting. Other people are a solution when they have the things that you want and are willing to give them to you. But people are a problem when they don't have the things you want and or they have them and won't give them to you. So if there are things that I need or want but I don't have and you do, I need to find a way to like, get them from you. And what we functionally discovered through thousands and thousands of years of living together is one of the best ways to do that, the, one of the best ways for me to get what I want from you is for me to give you something that you want in return. Like that's the fundamental pro-social contract. Like that's why we come together into groups is because we decided to exchange complementary goods. Does that make sense? The other strategies are functionally to completely move away from people, which could look like eliminating the desire for those things inside of myself and or becoming so self-sufficient or self-reliant that I don't need other people. That's one strategy, but that's basically like living like a monk. Some people can do that, but most people can't or don't want to. And the other strategy is to is conquest and competition, which is, I, fuck you, I'm just gonna take it from you because I'm cleverer or bigger or stronger which is kind of frowned upon, right? It still happens, but it's frowned upon. So the most pro-social strategy that we've developed is to come together and the basis of, of any relationship is this mutual exchange of value. And we know this because people don't enter into relationships with people they want nothing to do with. You need to, that, I mean, that just doesn't happen, especially when other people exist in the world that you could have relationships with that you do want things from that you do want things to do with, right? So people don't often like this because it, 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 they feel often that it, um, it makes all relationships inherently transactional. But the point is, is that if there wasn't some transacted good that was moving between the two of us, we wouldn't have a basis of a relationship. Now, to be fair, this doesn't mean that everything is transactable. Um, so for example, in the book, I talk about like the three most important non-transactable goods for relationships are friendship, loyalty, and love. These things can't be bought at any price. You can't buy a friend. If you bought a friend, you don't have a friend, you have an entourage. You know what I'm saying? Um, you can't buy loyalty. If you bought loyalty, you don't have a loyal vassal, you have a mercenary, you know what I'm saying? You, you can't buy love. If you, tr if you think you've bought love, you just bought prostitution basically on, in so many words. So you can't buy these things at any price. So on some level, they're invaluable, which could mean that like, they're beyond value or they have no value because they can't be transacted. All of those things are given as a spontaneous gift at the pleasure of the giver and doesn't respect any kind of reciprocity. Like if you are my friend just because you expect me to be my friend in return, that's a transaction. You're, are you even really my friend? If you love me just until or as long as I love you back, did you really love me? You know what I'm saying? So what we've, what we've decided is that these, these non-transactable goods are very ennobling for the individuals involved, they can represent some of the, the highest states that people can aspire to, but relationships aren't necessary for them. Relationships are not necessary because these are, these are gifts that I can give you 
at my own pleasure. You can't buy them or earn them from me. And I don't expect anything in return. So there's actually no exchange in the gift giving. Do you understand? Like there are people out there who are loyal to celebrities or athletes or political leaders who don't even know that those people exist. But those loyal, they're, they're, those people are really loyal. Those people will, in some cases, kill or be killed for those other people who don't even know that they're alive. That is real loyalty. And those people might be more loyal to those folks that they've never met than to anybody they're actually in a relationship with. By the same token, some of the purest love is, is unreciprocated. I mean, in the romantic tradition, the, the, the knight in shining, shining armor actually chose a woman who was married to another man as the damsel to whom he would devote all of his chivalric acts. You, you didn't know that? Isn't that a fun fact? Yeah, the idea here is twofold. One is that it would prevent an actual consummation of the relationship, at least in theory. I'm sure sometimes they actually crossed a boundary, but at least in theory, we're never actually going to consummate this relationship sexually. So that allows the game to go on as long as possible. And two, because the purity of my love in the romantic tradition would be cheapened by commingling it with base carnality, I am purifying my love because the highest expression of love is non-sexual. And the, the term purifying is, is interesting because this, let's say the cult of romantic love, we might say it even originated in the south of France by the sect of Catholicism called the Cathars, which means like the purifiers. And the Cathars believed in purifying themselves. Um, they didn't believe in marriage. They didn't believe in, um, they were trying to like elevate beyond those, those worldly instincts so that they could have a more divine relationship. And so they chose a woman that they actually had no fear or hope of consummating as their romantic ideal. Isn't that interesting? It's also in helpful because one of the th primary drivers of romantic attraction is unobtainability. People want what they can't have. And so you're gonna be much more attracted to me if I feel like I, I can't get you. On that note, uh, what do you think about marriage? What do you mean? Are you interested in marriage? To me, um, the, like the con I don't know what it's like in Japan, but in America, the convention, like the legal reality of marriage doesn't make sense to me as a man. I, I can just say, and I don't think this should be in any way controversial, that the contract as I understand it, I don't see is, is taking on an, an enormous amount of risk for no compensation and additional privileges. So I, I'm not really sure why I would do that, especially if I don't have to. So the issue is that one of the, I, I, I talk about this in my forthcoming book, M marriage rates are down like uh, almost everywhere and divorce rates are up almost everywhere. So like what's going on? One of the problems I conceive is that people want marriage to be too many things. At the bare minimum, what they want marriage to be is a legal contract, like a business arrangement. They want it to be a solemn oath before God and to have some sort of religious dimensionality to it. They want it to be a cohabiting agreement. We live together, spend all of our time together. We're co-parenting um, and we're monopolized sex dealers for each other. So we're, we're in an exclusive sexual relationship. This is the, like the bare minimum. What's more, like we were talking about with the dissolution of the extended kin network, I want you to be all these other roles that were previously performed by my extended family and or the community in which I was embedded. And this is just too much for the institution of marriage to support. And when we don't tease apart these various components, well, just like a chain is only strongest according to how you know, the weakest link, it's only as strong as its weakest link. If all of these different things are admingled, 
it's going to fail at its most like vulnerable point. And if we can't like separate these, we're gonna just throw the whole thing out rather than just say, oh, well, let's just throw out this part that isn't working and keep the other four or five things. You see what I'm saying? And this is tough because people have a lot of romantic ideas about how relationships should look and how marriage should be. And they are very touchy about approaching the possibility of changing the structure of that relationship. It's kind of like a sacred Hindu calf. It's like, it clearly is failing, like in the sense that most marriages end in divorce. But no one has really a clear alternative to that. So if the alternative is either I assume this really risky venture where I've conflated all of these different responsibilities and expectations, which on some level I know I can't indefinitely and completely meet, or I have nothing, which is also what's happening is we see in the decline of marriage and the increase in divorce, an increase in just like total sexlessness and a decrease in even casual relationships. It's like men and women aren't even hooking up with each other as much as they were 10 years ago. I mean, maybe you've read that statistic in America, men under 30, like the number of men under 30 who have not had any sex in the past 12 months has tripled in the last 10 years to, from 10% to 30%. 30% of men under 30, which is that decade, the 20s, is so important to long-term mating. One th in three men are completely invisible in the sexual marketplace how could that not have consequences for those men? And how can that not have consequences to the women who are looking to, um, to potentially in the future, because there's no hurry right now, of course, uh, in the future, settle down and have a relationship. Um, and I think that's potentially one of the opportunities is that we should learn what are the various components to this hyper conflated institution of marriage and begin to kind of tease them apart and say, okay, rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater or having absolutely no structure and chaos, it's like we can keep some of these things and we don't need these things. And that can be a personal decision made by the actual individuals in that relationship. I think that might be the only real way to save marriage, in my opinion, because the, the conservatives either the political conservatives or the religious traditionalists, they wanna go back to a time where, you know, people had values and that they had morals and it's like, and that women, you know, commitment came before sex and it's like, but that's not, that posture, that position flies in the face of certain economic realities in the contemporary sexual marketplace. Like the genie is not going back in the bottle. We're never going to have commitment before sex unless some other things change that have nothing to do with values and morality. And simply saying that people should do this because it's good for them is not enough. Like moral arguments are ineffective in motivating individual change. That's not, that's not how you you change people's behavior by making moral arguments. It sounds like the internet and social media and dating apps and all that has introduced far too many carrots. In a way, there's there's too many, what's the word, incentives now that never existed before. So I think to, to rely more on these moral arguments, you'd have to kind of, you know, put the internet back in the bottle. The internet back in the bottle, probably birth control back in the bottle. Um, that's never gonna happen. That's, that's never gonna happen. Like those two technologies, which I talk about in my, my book, are so deeply integrated into our social fabric and the day-to-day -day existence of our everyday lives and are also so clearly related to certain benefits that like the internet has made information so much more available, also misinformation and disinformation more available, but it's also made it so much more convenient to, to, to do your shopping. It's, there's infinite entertainment, which is a pacifier on a social level at your fingertips. You can work from your home. I mean, there's so many 
potential positives here. Birth control is irrevocably associated with all of women's social progress of the last 70 years. Like feminism has existed for a long time, but it wasn't really until they could functionally get out of the kitchen and the nursery by taking effective personal control over their reproduction that they could enter into the marketplace as an economic force in earnest. Like that couldn't happen if they were, if they had 10 kids. Like it's just, that's an impossibility. It would just have been an ideology that couldn't really be realized. Birth control allows feminism to be realized. Without birth control, feminism would just be a set of principles. Another thing to keep in mind is, yeah, I was talking about this earlier, is that dating apps and social media have created the illusion of infinite optionality. And this prevents people from making a decision because somewhere in that sea of infinite optionality is a better option than you. And especially if I don't feel this urgent necessity to commit to anything right now, why would I do my future self the disservice of foreclosing with you when I know for sure that a more attractive option exists in the sea of infinite optionality? So it delays making a decision and, and forming a commitment. Um, but it's a trap because optionality is like potential. It doesn't, it's like nothing. It doesn't really exist. When, when people fall for the trap of infinite optionality, they think they're giving up this big thing. They're giving up everything for one thing, which seems like this infinite loss. But in reality, it's an infinite gain because what they had was just optionality, was just potential, which is nothing. You can't eat the potential of a dinner, you know? Um, you, you can't mate with an option, you know? So what commitment actually does is transform nothing into something from zero to one, which is an infinite gain. But it takes some maturity to be able to understand that. Another thing to consider is that dating apps uh, tend to, are, are actually decreasing the rate at which people get into relationships, which on the surface makes about as little sense as the fact that after the widespread proliferation of birth control, single motherhood went through the roof. Like how is it that giving women control over their reproduction on that level led to more single mothers. Like who would have predicted that? But that's exactly what has happened, right? Who would have predicted that by bringing the entire sexual marketplace into your living room, into your smartphone, that that would make fewer relationships happen? But we've actually seen that to be the case in the last 10 years. And I think I have an explanation for why that is. Do you mind if I share it? Um, to understand this explanation, we have to make two assumptions. The first assumption is that fundamentally in the sexual marketplace, men attempt to trade resources, which can mean lots of things. It could be money, attention, energy, opportunity. They attempt to change, exchange resources for sex. And women attempt to use the sexual opportunity for resources, to, to accumulate resources, to acquire resources, okay? And we also have to assume that people will not pay more for the same good than they have to. Now, if you assume that both of those things are true, you can understand why dating apps are driving down the rate of relationships because basically, um, if I'm a man and I'm attempting to exchange resources for sex, I am going to, I know that somewhere in that infinite sea of optionality, there's someone willing to sell me sex more cheaply. They're going to be less difficult. They're maybe not even going to have to expect a date or an extended courtship process. Maybe they'll just come over and we can hook up. And if you balk at that, that's okay. There's a bajillion other women out there. And I guarantee at least one of them will be able to, will be willing to sell at that price. It's sort of like what globalism did to American jobs on some level, right? And so what does that do is it tends to polarize men in that direction. And so what do women complain about on dating apps is fuckboys, is men just want to hook up. 
well, yeah, because they can get sex from somebody else more cheaply than apparently they can get it from you who demands an emotional connection and demands a courtship and demands like an extensive texting process. Or it's like, you're, that's expensive in the marketplace of the dating app where there's other women who are willing and able to transact at a lower price point, basically. On the other hand, to the extent that women are trying to exchange their sexual opportunity for resources, um, then there is in that sea of infinite optionality a man who's willing to pay more for her sexual opportunity. And that's generally why on almost every woman's profiles, they come right out of the gate saying, I'm looking for a serious relationship. Like, I, I, I don't talk to me even unless you're willing to commit, get married, have children on this timeline. I've, I've read that on dating apps. And that's, you have to understand that that's, the gendered equivalent to a guy saying, I just want to fuck. Don't waste my time with dates and emotional conversations. I don't really care. I just want your body. Do you understand? Like that wouldn't go over well for a woman. This doesn't go over well to men. Women don't understand that. They think they're dating intentionally by being clear about what they want. But that's the gendered equivalent to a guy just saying, I'm, I'm just here to fuck. Okay. And they're willing to do this because somewhere in the sea of all that infinite optionality, they can reasonably assume that there is a man who's willing to pay more for their given sexual opportunity. And so that's the complaint that men encounter on these dating. All these women, they just, they not only want a very, very attractive man, you know, I'm, I'm only five, eight, they say, so I just get filtered out. And that's true for, for some women. They want a very, very attractive man who is willing to give them everything that they want. And that man must exist somewhere out there in the sea of infinite optionality. And if you're less attractive or you're willing to pay less for my sexual opportunity, then I'm not gonna deal with you. And here's the real crazy thing is that both the men and the women are correct in their economic assessment of the marketplace within their perspectives. The men are correct that when you flood the market with women, there's gonna be women out there who will have sex for less investment. And women are also correct that if you flood the market with men, there's gonna be some men out there who are gonna be interested in paying a lot for what they have to offer. But what that functionally does is it means that men and women are getting too far away from each other in terms, like they can't, it's harder and harder to negotiate. Like if I think I should be able to, to access your sexual opportunity on pennies on the dollar, but you think I need to give you a serious relationship and a lifetime commitment, we're not gonna meet in the middle. We're, we're too far away from each other. And, and that's only going to continue as people get more involved in this and dating apps and social media basically become isomorphic with the sexual marketplace on a global level. It's like, could a, an American... Uh, could an American factory worker compete with the Chinese factory worker? No, like we, that company only needs to pay the Chinese factory worker a dollar. That's why all the factories went to China. And it's like, that's what's happening in the sexual marketplace. And it's driving the, the various valuations, both of which are correct within their own gendered subjective experiences further and further away from each other. That's why fewer people are entering into relationships. I see what you mean. So you're kind of like out of negotiating range yeah. to where... You know, if you go into a negotiation expecting, uh, maybe we'll end up at 20%, and then someone says 70%, you're like, oh, I'm not, not going to talk to you. Yeah, it's more like I'm looking for marriage and children, and, and the guy's like, the best I can do is a drink. <laughs> you know, you're, you're probably not going to find a common ground there. Yeah. So how does that end? Well, what we've seen is that that means that fewer men and women are getting into even casual sexual relationships with each other. And on some level, casual sexual relationships are important because they often lead to more significant sexual relationships, more committed sexual relationships. In our society, for better or for worse, sex precedes commitment. So if you want the committed sexual relationship, you kind of have to be willing to enter into the casual sexual relationship. This didn't used to be the case. You know, they used to say, why buy the cow if you can get the milk for free? But that suggests that most milk wasn't being given away for free. If you live in a pasture where milk 
is freely available, then not giving away milk is a liability. Giving away milk no longer becomes a reason for buying the cow, but not giving the milk becomes a reason not to buy it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they're, they're not entering into relationships, right? Now, some people, that's okay. They'll, they'll live their whole lives and they'll just be with their friends or their extended family and they'll, they'll devote their lives to their career or maybe they'll just have short-term relationships and they'll, that's gonna be fine with them. But for a lot of people, especially as they get older, uh, they, they see the next 40 years of their life and there is no partner, there is no family, they start to get anxious, especially women. These could be women that in their 20s devoted that time to pursuing short-term hedonistic pleasure and or their careers. And they say, oh, I have plenty of time if I wanna do that anyway. And they get to be their, their mid-30s and they start to change their mind or their priorities begin to shift. But for a long time, if the valuation is very different, you kind of have this Mexican standoff. Well, the guy's like, well, I'm not gonna wife you up just to get laid. And well, I'm not gonna fuck you just, it's like, who's gonna, who's gonna blink first on some level? And if you play the cards out, women are gonna blink first. Because for better or for worse, women are on a shorter biological time frame with respect to those options. Like you can be 60 as a man and have kids. I think Al Pacino just had a kid in his 80s. Maybe he's even 91 or something like that. The woman's really beautiful too. So like for better or for worse, we men have a, a longer window in which to make these determinations about reproduction and family. Women don't. Which, which means that if someone's gonna blink, if someone's gonna, in this game of chicken, it's going to eventually be women. So if, you, if that's true, women should blink as soon as possible on some level because a, a lot of guys are comfortable with the short-term relationship strategy and they have more time to figure it out, especially if they devote their 30s and 40s, potentially even their 50s, to their career, their status, their wealth, their health. Like they're gonna remain a, a very attractive or even a more attractive option for women as they age. The same is not generally true for women. The the old fashioned idea, the kind of perhaps sexist ideas of like women should learn how to do this or that so they can be appealing to men and, and get married by the time they're, uh, you know, I don't know, 27. I, I think it used to be like, it, it's getting older and older, right? It used to be like, what, to like 18 or something. Yeah, there's this really classic Japanese movie called Late Spring. It's by the Japanese filmmaker Ozu, I forget his first name, um, but he's a master of Japanese cinema. This movie is on like many critics' top 100 films ever made in the history of the world. And it's kind of difficult to watch in the present age. I mean, it's a beautiful film that's very well acted, but it stars this young woman who I think is like 26 in the movie. And the whole movie is about, oh, this old maid, you know, no man is ever gonna want this woman. You're gonna spend the rest of your life alone. You're already unattractive, sweetheart. She's a beautiful Japanese starlet, you know what I'm saying? Um, but that was the culture back then. 26 was ancient in the sexual marketplace game. And my friend Sean Smith talks about how Feminism has kind of lied to a lot of women in the sense that it's, it's lied to them when it tells them that they can have everything. And he says that it's not really true that you can have everything. One, because everything comes with a trade-off. You know, if you choose this path, this path is now closed to you. I think he says that women might be able to have everything, but not at the same time or something like that. I screwed up the quote. I shouldn't have quoted him unless I got it right. Sorry, Sean. Um, so, like if I had a daughter, one of the things I would communicate to her is some of these realities about when she is going to be best positioned to enter into a long-term committed relationship with an attractive uh, man, okay? Would be in her early to mid-20s. 
And why not devote just those like five years after college to that project? If that doesn't work, you, you clearly can still potentially get into a relationship at 26 and beyond, but why not prioritize that? A lot of women, when they devote so much of their time to their careers, especially in their 20s, they're consciously thinking that they're doing it as a hedge. They're thinking, well, I might not be able to meet a man that I really like or who will wife me up. And so I have to hedge my bet, Orion. I don't want to just be dependent on a man for his finances or to just wait around for a guy to wife me up. It's like, fair enough. And especially if you're living independently, you have to find a way to make a living. But if you devote 40 to 60 hours a week, every week, for every month, for every year of your 20s, to a certain enterprise, that's not a hedge. That is your principal bet. And when women do that, at the end of the 30s, what do they have? They have a fairly decent professional situation because that's what they've spent 99% of their time and energy devoted to. I bet that if those same women, if they wanted to, spent 99% of their energy trying to find a husband between the ages of 20 and 25, they could do it. And if they eventually feel like they miss out, much like the women who devote their 20s and 30s to their career, if they eventually get older and they think, oh, I'm missing out on family and children and all that, well, it's harder for them to get that at 35. But by the, same, but by the opposite side of things, if a woman gets married at 25 and then at thir in her late 30s, she says, you know, I feel like I've missed out on a career, she can have a job. Like m most women are trading that family life for a, to be an employee. Right. Let's, let's be real, you know, they're, they're holding jobs. Most of them are not, um, you know, writing the, the next great American novel yeah. or um, making Nobel scientific discoveries. They're, they're just working a job. They're an employee and you can be an employee at 35. You can be an employee at 45, but it might be harder for you to be a wife at 35 or a wife at 45. So I think that if women want to have it all, they can do it all, but they should reverse the order in which they go about doing certain things. There are some women in uh, Japan who the term is OL, office lady. Uh -huh. So they're they're going into a job knowing that they're going to be doing kind of miscellaneous tasks. It's not going to be a particularly fulfilling career, but for them, they just see it as something to do while they're, while they're looking for a husband. Yeah. And I think, again, if I had a daughter, one of the best ways that you could do that is like go where the men are that you might want to marry, like become a paralegal and spend all day with successful high paying lawyers. I guarantee you wear some pencil skirts and you, you do your hair, you're gonna look so much better than some of those older office ladies. Those men are gonna be very, very busy. It's like Hannibal Lecter said, people covet what they see every day. So if, you, if they see you 320 days out of the year, hour after hour after hour, I guarantee at least a few of those men are gonna be in love with you at the end of the year. I guarantee it. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, yeah, the office ladies will usually aim for a, a prestigious company, not necessarily because they think they're going to make a lot of money, but they'll meet guys sure. who are on the up and up. So yeah. yeah. Another suggestion that I've had is like, if you don't want to do that, figure out where they hang out. Like in New York, the, the finance guys are hanging out in Tribeca. You want a finance guy? Do some research. Make yourself a regular at some of these bars where you show up looking good during happy hour. I guarantee you're gonna to get to know some of those finance dudes. You don't like finance and you want, uh, you want the artsy types, they hang out in the East Village or around you know, like Gramercy Park, Madison Square Park. It's like you can find those guys, you need to figure out where they're congregating and then make yourself a regular presence in, around those groups of men. If you're, especially if you're by yourself, like a woman is not long alone. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that can be dangerous because she might be approached by men that she doesn't really want to interact with, which is generally why women go out at least in pairs, if not in groups, but that's kind of difficult for a lot of guys to break into. Um, if they're alone and they keep showing up over and over again, they will meet men and they can target specific groups of men. 
They could even target specific individual men through the use of social media. Like the fact that more women don't just DM the dudes that they want to be in relationships with is baffling to me. Like you have direct access to celebrities, to athletes, to politicians, to millionaires, to billionaires. Well, if he liked me, he'd make an effort. It's like, what? <laughs> you don't have to do anything? <laughs> really? Like DM and, and like bait your hook. And, and, and I mean that you should bait your hook with, with sex, basically. Is that kind of what you're talking about with the, you mentioned the men, the enemy of women is pride. So this kind of like, of them, oh, yeah. if he liked me, I. Oh yeah. Well, you know, for all of the social advances that women have made in the last 70 years, they still are waiting for the offer. They're still waiting for me to walk across the room and say, hey, I'm Orion, how are you doing? They're still waiting for me to propose the date and ask them out. They're still waiting for me to get down on one knee and put a ring on their finger. Yeah, and historically, women actually were more in control of the initiation of an interaction than I think they currently are. I mean, the stereotype in Victorian England is they'd be walking through the park and they'd drop their handkerchief strategically in front of the man, and the man, oh, miss, excuse me. And they have the little meet-cute situation that she actually orchestrated because she had seen him long in advance and said, I wanna do this, I wanna make this happen. So if women want something, they kinda have to make it happen or at least they can't exclusively expect the man to make it happen. And it's never been easier in the history of the world for women to make it happen. You just slide into somebody's DMs. Do you think any men would be kind of turned off by that or a little suspicious? I think if they're too overt with the sexual offer, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Like one of my favorite studies is, was done several decades ago, and it was examining men and women's differential responses to overt invitations to sex. Have you heard this one? I talked about it in one of my interviews recently. I think so, but, but go on. Basically, the researchers got an attractive young man, an attractive young woman to memorize the same script and go up to co-eds on a college campus of the opposite sex. And the script was basically something like, hey, I've seen you around campus. You seem like you're very attractive. Would you like to come to bed with me? That was basically what they said, three lines. And when the attractive man went up to hundreds of young women with this script, 0% of them said yes and accepted the offer. Whereas when an attractive woman did the same to the men, 75% of the men said that they were willing to do this like 75%, you need to say three lines and you have a better chance than not of entering into a sexual relationship with someone. Is it always successful to make an overt sexual invitation to men? No, apparently one in four men weren't open to that invitation. They don't say this in the paper, but I personally believe it's because one in four men thought that there was something suspicious about an attractive woman coming up to them, asking them to just come to bed with them. Maybe they were looking around for the hidden camera. To, uh, maybe they suspected that something was, was up about this encounter. And so I think that it would actually be very higher, much higher, if that interaction were to take place more anonymously or virtually. Um, but it's that those are fantastic numbers. If three out of four men are going to be open to a sexual overture, that's a great way of entering into a relationship with a man. And what you have to understand as a woman is that if women are the gatekeepers of sex, men are the gatekeepers of relationship and commitment. And sex is like the Trojan horse that motivates the men to open the gates to let her into the city. If she's just standing out there demanding a committed relationship, the guy's gonna say, well, what's in it for me? You know what I'm saying? They're not gonna open the gates for that. Sex is the invitation, is the, is, the, is, the, is the open sesame that gets her in. Now, whether she stays in has to do with how she makes use of that opportunity. But you have to get in to stay in. And that's what a lot of women don't understand. Well, as, and part of the pride is, you know, I, I, a lot of women are, 
contemptuous or even disgusted by male attraction and sexuality. They, I don't want to be desired for my body. And I can understand that for some, you know, to some extent, because, you know, they might work out and diet and, and whatnot, but like their body wasn't really their choice. You know, it doesn't really reflect their conscious personality and who they and who they are, like within that body. You know what I'm saying? They want to be seen and they want to be appreciated for their intelligence and their creativity and their their sp their spark and their humor and their joy and and men can and do appreciate women for those things later later but most guys are too horny they're too starved that they can't think about those things yet it's like asking a guy who hasn't eaten in a week to think about something other than food. He's not going to be able to do that. But if you feed him, he will be open to all kinds of conversations. Do you understand? Yeah. Honestly, I'm probably a much better date if the date starts with sex and then we go out and do something. Really? <laughs> I'm probably... No kidding. Well, not a first date. Okay. Not a first date. Um, I, like the, I like that there's some buildup. For me, sex becomes more necessary and certainly more pleasurable and exciting when there's some sexual tension that gets developed first. Mm -hmm. And generally the date is an opportunity to develop that tension. Yeah. It, it, I mean, if it's, um, if it's someone I've, if a girlfriend or someone I've been dating for a while, it's like, okay, let's, Oh, sure. Let's have sex and then we'll go out and do whatever you want. And I'll, I'll be maybe have sex when we come back, who knows? But like, yeah, I can see that. Sure. Yeah. You know, first things first. Um, the tricky thing is getting everything started, right? Mm -hmm. Because for many women, sex is the fruit of the tree. You have to plant the seed, you have to water it, you have to be patient, you have to prune it, you have to nurture it, then it blossoms, and then it ripens, and then there's this fruit. It's like, I, love, I really like you, and I want you to have this kind of a thing. Whereas for men, sex is like the seed. A lot of men, we... We don't even really know if you like us ladies until you sleep with us. Yeah. Like that's the real, um, that's the real test of whether a woman likes you. Because every guy has heard, oh, I like you so much, but just as a friend, or I, I, I just can't do this right now. And it's like, well, shit, man, if you liked me, what's the problem? So that doesn't feel like liking to us when you say you like us, but you don't sleep with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. how it is. Yeah, for a guy, it's like you don't even have to like the person. Like, if you like them, it's a bonus. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. And there's a number of reasons why that's the case. I talk about some of them in my book. I'm sure David Buss talks about them in some of his work as well. Um, men and women differentially prioritize things in a reproductive opportunity. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's a, I don't know how you could argue that the fact that a man produces trillions of sperm every few days, but a woman produces one viable egg a month wouldn't have some sort of impact on their sexual choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense to me. So even if you just look at the, the hormone levels, so for example, like men have 10x the testosterone in women, but women have 4x the estrogen and 4x the oxytocin in men. Mm -hmm. And these have like dr drastic changes on people's behavior. Oh, oh sure. Yeah. yeah. One of the most interesting videos that you might be able to watch on YouTube are interviews with women who are undergoing sexual reassignment to become men mm -hmm. when they start to take tea or testosterone. And this is their eureka moment where they finally fucking understand men. And these people are just like, so many things make sense to me now. They get it, like, because it's inside of them. They can feel what it's doing to them. And they realize that men are not crazy or any more than like women are crazy when they do things that are hormonal in their own cycles. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that those individuals often are frustrated by their uh, by their rampant new sex drive, primarily because they have no refractory period because they're still biologically women. 
Oh, interesting. Which means that wow. sex doesn't give them the release from the desire to have sex than it does for men. So some of them said it was kind of a torture. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I mean, like, having no refractory period sounds cool if you could turn it off when you want. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy my refractory period. Right. And it's like, it's, it's the moment of greatest peace in my day or my week, for sure. What, what, what is it in English? It's a... Uh... In Japanese, it's it's wise man mode. <laughs> Post nut clarity. I like yeah, wise yeah, there man you go. Mode there you go. Post nut clarity. I think Schopenhauer called it the devil's laughter because <laughs> it's when the man gets to hear the consequences of his poor judgment. When, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Look what I made you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll do it again in a few hours. <laughs> See you next weekend. <laughs> What, before we wrap up, why don't we, if you're willing to, um, s s switch gears and talk about spirituality a little bit. I had this one question, and it could go in two different directions because I was thinking about the fact that there are no rituals for men anymore. There's no, there's no boy-to-man ritual. How, for example, I feel like whenever this comes up, it seems like everyone knows about it because it's so interesting. And I feel like men are like naturally drawn to this kind of thing. The, the story of the, and I think you've mentioned it too, the, where they put the gloves. No, yeah, you did mention it where the, where you put your, the, the gloves on the gloves filled with bullet ants. And that's how you become a man by getting stung endlessly by bullet ants. And you do yeah, that multiple times. Apparently yeah. you're supposed to put the mittens on like dozens of times before the tribe fully accepts you. It's not just once. Yeah, and each, I think, session lasts at least an hour. I watched a video of a Western ethnologist or anthropologist who studied that tribe in the Amazon rain basin, and he put the gloves on, and it was a com like he completely unraveled, and he was a grown man, and this is what they do to you know, 12, 13-year-old boys. Wow. No, that's a researcher <laughs> willing yeah. to do it. Yeah. It's okay. Around, man. So it's, so I guess the way that links with spirituality, or maybe it doesn't, but you know, there's this kind of like shift of this psychological shift of like, I, uh, was a boy and did this insane thing. Now I'm a man. Now I have, you know, they just kind of embody, uh, I would imagine it given this, this intense confidence to, act and be more courageous as a man of being like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm a man. I did sure. the thing. Yeah. Um, I think that there's some truth to that. I also think that you can't ever do it once and coast on it. Yes, there are, let's say, coming of age rituals. But as a man, as I would think also in these communities where these rituals are still practiced or have been practiced, you couldn't just say, I demonstrated bravery 40 years ago. As I'm a man, you know, that's sort of like the the guy who was the high school quarterback who, you know, now he's middle-aged and overweight and he's like, those were the days, man, oh, yeah. when I scored that touchdown. It's like you you actually have to continuously earn your manhood mm -hmm. as a man. And I think that's not something that women understand. Mm -hmm. If you go too long without re-earning it, it sort of dwindles and and fades and it's not the basis of legitimate respect among either men or women. Now is, like, can you imagine though, in today's day and age, in our culture, like forcing 13 year old boys to come into contact with their own mortality and to, and to like basically torture them for a purpose. Yeah. Like there's no way that would ever happen. Yeah. But might that be useful? It might. It might be useful. I think, among other things, it forces, what is it? It's like that It's like that moment in Dune. Did you read Dune, where he has the initiation ritual? I haven't seen the movies, but the books are pretty good. And he has to put his hand in a box. Oh, I, I did see the movie. And, and that asks, scene what, was in what's there. in the box? And they say pain. That's it. And he puts his hand in the box, and it's the most intense pain he's ever felt and he feels like the skin is being ripped off and his hand has been obliterated, but he takes it out and his hand is intact and totally fine. I think that 
there is a point that you reach with enough pain where you understand that on some level pain is sensation plus judgment. Like you can begin to tease apart the component aspects of pain, probably because you have to, otherwise you'll be destroyed by the experience of the pain. That's how intense it is to be. But through enough focus, it's almost like you can split the atom of pain and you can enter into the experience and it's not pleasant, but it won't destroy you. But that requires really a, a mind of steel that's probably tempered by the necessity of dealing with intense pain. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, of course. Did you meditate a lot at some point? Sure, I've been interested in spirituality since I was a kid. Like I've, I have a kind of an interesting path around that. Like I went to Jewish school for seven years, but I'm not ethnically Jewish, but I, I still read Hebrew. I know a lot about Judaica. I studied that just because that's the school I went to. By the same token, I went to church every Sunday and was, got my communion, was confirmed. Um, I lived in a Buddhist monastery in China. I've studied shamanism uh, from the Amazon traditions. I have extensively studied different Buddhist paths, especially Zen Buddhism. Uh, I like religion. Like, I don't think religion is a bad word. Religion actually etymologically comes from the words re, like re, like to, to go back, and ligare, which is to connect. So religion means to reconnect. Mm. To reconnect with what? To reconnect with yourself, to reconnect with reality, to reconnect with a higher power. It's like sometimes we can be lost in life. How does the divine comedy start? Dante's basically saying, I came to the midway of my life, he's in his 40s, and I was lost in a forest. It's like, yeah, that's what happens to people, is mostly through no conscious intention, but just through the busyness of their lives and just a mundane sequence of events, they get lost in the forest of life. And they become mindless, and they lose their direction, and they lose their purpose. And so religion is one instrument for reconnecting people with purpose and reconnecting people with themselves grounded in a re, like a hierarchical reality in which they find themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm, I'm really interested in this kind of stuff and not really from an academic perspective, but again, because I was in a great deal of pain. And I mean, maybe not when I was a young, young boy, but like that's kind of where I went for answers is philosophy and theology. And it wasn't because I wanted to know how many angels could fit on the head of a pin. It's because I wanted to know how to fucking suffer less because I was hurting. And apparently there were some really wise people that have existed on this planet who have examined that question very, very deeply and have come up with systematized approaches for solving that problem, which is basically what a lot of religious practice is is life is fucking suffering. If hell exists, it's here. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a way out. And here's one way out. That's what I think religion is when it does what it's supposed to do. Is there one in particular, you gra if you don't mind sharing, if it, that you gravitate to or you found that was particularly helpful for you? Well, from a philosophical standpoint, the one that definitely was most helpful was stoicism. Like, I really studied that in depth and read everything that I could. And then about mm, 10 or so years ago, tried to implement that in my everyday life as extensively as possible. And that was very difficult in the beginning, but has paid off an enormous number of dividends as the years go on. Like, I'm so much more emotionally stable. I'm so much more equilibrated mentally. Um, it takes so much more to, to get me out of my center. I feel more joy and peace in my life as a consequence of that lack of emotional instability and that mental confusion. So that one has been very, very helpful for me. Um, Buddhist principles have, all, have, have been very um, 
very useful, as well as, let's say, Christian mythology. I think there's a, a lot of really important and useful teachings in, in the life and story of Jesus in particular. In a way, you could make the claim that they're almost expressing the same thing in kind of a way. So, for example... You mean all the religions are expressing the same thing? Well, at least the ones that I'm aware of. I just want to make sure I know what you're talking about. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, so, for example, you might say that uh, there's, there's this kind of... It sounds like there's this ineffable essence that's part of humans... You might call it Buddha nature, uh, another perspective that is like the groundless ground. It's where like a everything that exists before all the different concepts that compose your personality exists. Like your, you could say it's your life force or your chi or something. Um, and I'm, I'm not super familiar with Catholicism, but it seems like you could say that is like maybe another way to conceptualize it is it's God. So... Well, a very deep understanding of spirituality will make you incredibly brave because you'll realize that you are indestructible. Because there's really only two possibilities that I can see and that seem to be reflected in the various spiritual and religious traditions that we have on this planet that answer the question of who are you? Like, what is your identity? One of the thought exercises that I use to help people approach this idea is to imagine what would be left if everything that can be taken from you is taken from you. Because any, anything that can be taken from you isn't you. You clearly can exist without it. And it will be taken from you in time. At some point we give all of those things up that we've been given. And what I have basically discovered is that there's really only two answers to that question of what is left after everything that can be taken from you is taken from you. Either some essential being that can survive even the death of the physical body remains, like the spirit or the soul that is eternal and potentially a spark of the divine flame, as you might say, like a portion of, of, of God, because it's indestructible. It's a portion of reality. Or there's nothing, which is the Buddhist conceptualization, that your sense of self is an illusion caused by these aggregates and memory, which makes you believe that you persist as a static entity through time. But if you actually split the atom and you tease everything apart, you'll see that you're just an epiphenomenon that is created by these various components, right? So if you are fundamentally nothing, what do you have to fear? How can you be hurt if you don't exist? And if even death can't hurt you, what do you have to be afraid of? So it's easy to say this, and it's easy to hear this, but it's a totally different thing to integrate that so firmly into your being that you no longer fear anything that life has to offer you. But that's actually the premise and the promise of of religious discipline is that is like existential courage mm -hmm. it's like the courage that enables certain folks to speak truth to power because like i serve a higher authority like why do i have anything to fear what can you what can you do that other person could actually like completely obliterate me but you could just kill me and we even see strains of that in philosophical thought. It's like when Socrates said that the people who persecuted him could kill him, but they couldn't harm him. Like, that's a really interesting idea. It's like, you would think that being killed would be a form of harm, but according to Socrates, apparently not. That harm had to do with the conscious choice to be unethical or to be unvirtuous. And if that's what harm means to the individual, then who could possibly harm him but himself? But on some level, of course, anybody could kill my body if they're bigger and stronger than me, you know? Like the Stoics said, you know, if, if my neck could do any good for you, you can have it. 
Like who's to say that my neck is the only one that can't be severed? Clearly, you can, you can cut my head off. If that somehow does you a service, okay. But to say that bravely in the face of an actual powerful threat that can make good on that danger is something that is impressive indeed. It's very easy to, well, I'd be brave. I'd, I'd tell the truth to that dictator or that emperor. It's like, oh, I don't, I'm not so sure. That'd be really tough. I mean, they talk about that when Socrates was arrested and um, convicted and he was awaiting his uh, poisoning, basically. He was in jail. And his friends basically come to visit him in jail. Did you, have you read this one? So he's already been condemned to be put to death for corrupting the youth of Athens. And his friends come to visit him and they basically say, uh, Socrates, we're gonna bust you out of here. Like, don't worry about us. Like, you're, you're too important, your life is valuable. We gotta get you out of here. And, and he was like, no, it's, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just stay here. Um, he had his various reasons for that, but I don't know how many people would not leave with their friends in the face of a death sentence. Like that is a superior human being or a very foolish one. <laughs> it's, it's like the samurai, like they, that was one of the reasons or the reason they meditated was so that they could no longer fear death. Yeah, I don't, I, I, maybe it is possible through meditation alone to resolve the fear of death. Like certainly if you look into the Buddhist mythology, it is. Like when he sat down in, on the Bodhi tree and he was went through all the Mara and the temptations and the, the terrors of Maya. If you believe that, you can get through all that simply with your eyes closed in lotus position. But I, I think that we're often subject to the temptation that we're braver than we think because we haven't been tested by reality. It reminds me of what David Goggins said about planning your next like marathon or whatever. He said, okay, if you're, if you want to do an ultra marathon, make that decision in the middle of a marathon. <laughs> Not when you're sitting on the couch thinking, how cool would it be to say that I run an ultra marathon? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That will definitely get me laid. You ran how many ultra marathons? Well, yes, you can come home with me. Generally not how it works. <laughs> Shall we end on that? Is there anything else you want to add? No, this has been great, man. I'm glad you came up to me in that cafe. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> months ago. It's been good getting to know you socially and uh, this was a lot of fun. So thanks for having me on. You too. Th Ryan, thanks so much.